Mother 3, the final game in the trilogy, the only game that is yet to officially release outside of Japan, the game that pretty much single-handedly convinced me to cover this series. Mother 3 is a lot of things, and I can sit here and tell you it's an amazing game and all that, and trust me, I'm gonna spend most of this video doing that very thing anyways. But let me take it a step further to give you a better sense of where I'm coming from. Xenoblade Chronicles is my all-time favorite game. Right below that, I haven't made up my mind if it's Final Fantasy VII Remake or Xenoblade Chronicles 3 because, gosh, that game had no right being as good as it turned out. But sitting at a comfortable third place is Mother 3 and at one point, it was actually at the very top of my list. Mother 3 may not have been the first RPG I played, heck, not even the second or third one, but it was the first time that a game ever made me feel so attached to its world and characters and made me laugh, smile, and grieve along with them. Mother 3 was the most mature game I had played up to that point in my life. The way it depicts family, coming of age, fear, sadness for a Game Boy Advance game no less, these moments stuck with me so much that when the credits rolled, my first thought was, I wish I can erase my memory just to be able to play this again for the first time. With that being said, this is probably a given, but spoilers. Major, major spoilers to follow. If you haven't played Mother 3, do it. That's all I'm gonna say. Seek out the fan translation and just play it. Because at this rate, I have a better chance of being incinerated by Reggie than having my wish of an official Mother 3 localization come true. But I'll go into a bit more detail about that in a bit. If you're still here, then allow me to welcome you to my Mother 3 retrospective. And remember, no crying until the end. If you check this building in Foresight when playing Earthbound, you'll get a message that says planning meeting for Earthbound 2. Shigesato Itoi, apparently not knowing the concept of a good night's rest, was already working on the third Mother game as early as 1994. Much like that game, Mother 3 switched consoles in the middle of its development and was slated to launch on the Nintendo 64 instead of the Super Famicom. The team was excited to make the biggest and most ambitious Mother game yet, taking full advantage of the 64's hardware and inspiration from Mario's leap into the third dimension to create a fully realized 3D world. But one issue quickly reared its ugly head. That's disgusting. Unlike Sega and Sony, whose consoles were CD-based, Nintendo stubbornly stuck with cartridges for the main Nintendo 64 unit, a format that could only fit 64 megabytes of data. I'm well aware of the saying, size doesn't matter, but in this case, it did. And Nintendo knew this because they tried fixing it with another mistake. This is the Nintendo 64 disk drive, an add-on for the original console that used special disks in order to compensate for the memory limitations of cartridges. And how much data could these bad boy store? You are so disappointing on so many levels. So, the 64DD wasn't great, also grass is green, but the team worked with what they had and started developing Mother 3 exclusively for the add-on. The game was officially announced to be in production in 1997, and word made its way to the west as well, with screenshots and renders appearing in magazines and the game being unofficially dubbed Earthbound 64 outside of Japan. In 1999 at Space World, a fully playable build of the game was shown off with reports saying that the game was about halfway done. Done. This is also where that famous trailer of the N64 version of Mother 3 originated from. And yeah, nowadays the visuals look pretty dated, but I find this absolutely fascinating. Recognizing characters and set pieces from the final game in a version that never saw the light of day is really cool. And the trailer is only made better by the amazing music which also carried over into the final version. Despite the delays and the development team ultimately ditching the 64DD and going back to a regular cartridge to ship the game as, this trailer, the demo at Space World, and interviews with Itoi and even Miyamoto eased a lot of the public's worries about Earthbound 64's release, especially with all the marketing and confirmation of a May 2000 release in Japan. But sadly, I think we all know how this story ends. Just a couple of days before Space World 2000, Nintendo announced that Mother 3 and Earthbound 64 
had been cancelled. Much like its predecessor, the game did not have a smooth production. It was simply too big for the team to handle with the hardware they had and their lack of experience making 3D games. They not only wanted it to be large in scope, but also a showcase for the console as a whole before Nintendo's next generation system entered the scene. RPGs are already known for being really big games. That's why Squaresoft left Nintendo for Sony to continue their flagship series, Final Fantasy, on the PlayStation, as that console was much more well adept for handling games with expansive worlds and cinematic cutscenes. The N64 had like one RPG that's still relevant today. Earthbound 64 could have been the second, but alas, it wasn't meant to be. While the situation seemed rather grim, this didn't mean that Mother 3 itself was completely dead. Nintendo released two systems during the sixth generation, the GameCube and the Game Boy Advance, their next-gen handheld riding off of the success of the Game Boy and Game Boy Color. The GBA, power-wise, was like a mini Super Nintendo, and like the Super Nintendo, the system saw a lot of RPG love. The Mario and Luigi series saw its debut, we got ports of old Final Fantasy titles, Golden Sun, and franchises that had been stuck in Japan like Fire Emblem finally came to the States on the GBA. You probably know where this is going. The reason Mother 3 had such a hard time coming out for the 64 was the complexity brought on by making a 3D game with such an ambitious scope. If the game were to be revived, it probably wouldn't be for the GameCube. So much money had already been spent on the project, the GameCube was performing even worse than the 64 so the game's potential sales would only be hurt, and Nintendo pulled another Nintendo and designed the GameCube to use mini DVDs, which store less data than standard DVDs. However, transforming Mother 3 into a format that wouldn't be nearly as expensive to develop, like 2D, might just work. As I mentioned in the last two videos, Japan saw the release of Mother 1 Plus 2 in 2003, GBA ports of the first two Mother games. The commercials for this game ended with a message stating that Mother 3 was resurrected and being made for the GBA as well. But it wasn't until 2006 where more concrete information about the game started being shared by Itoi via an official website. The marketing for Mother 3 was a bit more unique this time around, really selling the greater emphasis on telling an emotional story while still keeping the series trademark humor. After after 12 years of development, Mother 3 was finally released on April 20th, 2006, fitting considering one of the game's most memorable moments is a drug trip. Unfortunately, unlike Earthbound, this third installment would remain exclusive to the Japanese market. Even after more than a decade of petitioning and begging Nintendo to localize Mother 3, despite the company acknowledging the game in pretty much every conceivable way other than releasing it worldwide, the most notable example being the game's representation and Smash starting with Brawl where the main protagonist Lucas was not only included as a playable character, but was even one of the main characters in the Subspace Emissary. Despite all of that, nothing. Sometimes we'd get hints and teases and rumors that this is the year Mother 3 is finally gonna be localized guys, but again, nothing. This was a game that had garnered so much acclaim in Japan, the finale of a series that many hold near and dear to their hearts. And after Itoi came out saying that he had no plans of continuing the franchise, it's depressing that so many people are unable to experience it. Like Mother 3 could be someone's favorite game ever, and they'd never know it because Nintendo is just not interested in making the game officially accessible. Like I think about a world where Project Rainfall failed, and Xenoblade remained a niche RPG G forever, that it never grew into the phenomenon that it is today, that I never got to discover some of the most amazing pieces of media I have ever experienced and Xenoblade X. At one point, I was pretty hopeful that it would happen during the Wii U era at the latest, and that hope was reignited a bit when Earthbound and Earthbound Beginnings were added to Switch Online. But we're not too far from the game's 20th anniversary, and we're still waiting. I can't go to the eShop and just buy this game. I can't browse the Wii U's GBA library and see a listing for Mother 3. I can't even fork over scalper prices for a physical copy of an official English translation because it doesn't exist. Mother 3 is the game that I think of when the topic of Nintendo's treatment of their legacy content comes up. An absolute masterpiece that I can't officially play in English. So with that in mind, how can I say with such confidence that the game is a masterpiece, if I can't technically play it? Well, because I have played it. I and countless others have played it, thanks to the efforts of the Mother fandom who have done what Nintendo refuses to do. 
it's finally time to talk about the Mother 3 fan translation. In 2008, the one and only Clyde Mandolin released a free patch for anyone with a Mother 3 ROM to download and use to make the game fully playable from beginning to end in English. Now, I've talked about this guy's background already in the Mother 1 video, but just as a quick reminder, this guy is a professional translator who has done invaluable work translating several video games, anime, and even interviews with a grade of quality that is unmatched. The Mother 3 fan translation is probably the best way that an international audience will ever be able to experience the game. This includes any theoretical official translation that Nintendo releases. A lot of care was put into making this translation as accurate as possible, preserving the tone and humor of the Japanese release without any censorship. One of the reasons that always comes up when discussing why Mother 3 has never been localized is the game's subject matter. There's a lot of mature and adult adult themes in the game, some swearing, and sprites that would likely bump the game's age rating up to a T at the very least. The fan translation doesn't mess with any of this, while an official English version probably would because, well, history has shown that to be the case. So for anybody watching this that wants to play Mother 3 but is holding out for an official release, well, buy the official release if Nintendo ever does release one, but at this point just go ahead and play the fan translation. It is excellent in pretty much every way. And heck, if you don't feel comfortable trying to get a ROM of the game, some people sell GBA carts already containing the ROM pre-patched. So if you want to play Mother 3, play Mother 3 in any way you can. That's exactly what I did. I was in middle school when I first played Mother 3. I played the fan translation on the GBA emulator with a keyboard on a used piece of shit HP laptop with a 2 hour battery life on a good day. I spent my entire summer playing Mother 3 and for the first time, falling in love with the Earthbound universe. Right away, I was sucked in just from my familiarity with Lucas and the music I recognized from playing an unhealthy amount of Brawl back in the day. But what kept me playing until I saw the credits was the story. I had played story-driven RPGs before this, you know, Final Fantasy and the like. RPGs with main character deaths. But Mother 3 managed to be strange, funny, and heart-rending all at the same time. Until Xenoblade Chronicles captured my heart in 2015, Mother 3 remained my undisputed favorite game ever. And it was a game that I technically played in a way I wasn't supposed to. Earthbound is an amazing game as well. By now, you all probably know the reasons why I love that game so much, and plenty of people see Earthbound as the best in the trilogy, and I can totally understand why. It's all a matter of personal preference at the end of the day, after all. But no matter what, when I look at these two side by side, Mother 3 is more of my cup of tea, and it's really no contest. I love it so much that it's the only Japanese physical game I own. Yeah, I imported a Japanese copy of Mother 3 just to have it as part of my collection and it works on my US GBA. I was actually surprised. I thought that the system would be region locked or something, but no. Now I can't really play the whole game this way, but it is super neat being able to play Mother 3 on the hardware it was made for. Well, if I wanted to take it a step further, I'd play it on the limited edition Mother 3 Game Boy Micro, also exclusive to Japan. But I'm not ready to take out a loan on a fucking retro console. Mother 3 has a much greater narrative focus than the first two games. Mother 1 and Earthbound were more about the individual encounters you'd run into on your journey. It's the small moments in those games that stick out to you the most, while the overarching plot about collecting melodies and taking down Gygus took more of a backseat until the endgame. Mother 3 is actually split up into chapters, with each one of them progressing the story in some form. It's also a lot more cutscene and text heavy, and spends more time, especially in the first few hours, developing its main character characters and establishing their personalities. This change in structure makes for a much more linear and story-driven game, which I think greatly benefits the experience. 9 times out of 10, people's praises of Mother 3 likely stem from how good the story is. It is what sets it apart from the last two games and makes it an unforgettable gem. The way I'm going to split this video up is instead of going over the entire plot first, I'm gonna start by just going over the first couple of chapters, then I'll talk about the non-story stuff like the gameplay, before 
before ending things by going over the rest of the story. When you start a new game, things already start to feel a bit different from the previous games. Being able to name the characters is nothing new, but for the first time, Mother 3 features a family at the forefront of the game's main cast. We have the twin brothers Lucas and Klaus, the father Flint, their mother Hanawa, and the loyal dog Boney. You can also input your favorite food and thing, the latter of which will serve as the name of Lucas's unique ability, but for this, I like keeping it as the default option. Love. After finishing this all up, you're introduced to the world of Mother 3, the Nowhere Islands. Lucas and his family hail from the peaceful Tasmeli village, but the game starts with him, Klaus, and Hinawa in the mountain region of the island visiting Hinawa's father, Alec. The intro establishes a soothing and relaxing atmosphere. The bustling cities, traffic, and convenience stores of the previous games are nowhere to be found. The twins play with the local wildlife consisting of f***ing dragons, don't worry, they're harmless, and a mole cricket that picks a fight, which Hinawa steps on afterwards. And the scene ends with Hinawa writing a letter to Flint before heading back home with her kids later in the night. But then, the calm is interrupted by an unidentified flying object blaring peculiar music, seemingly making its way toward the village. The game's title forms constructed from a mesh of tree bark and metal, before fading away to reveal explosions going off in the forest connecting Tasmeli village and the mountain region, the ones responsible being the suspicious people wearing pig masks. Then the chapter's title is revealed, Night of the Funeral. And right away you feel a sense of dread, and that the peacefulness of the intro is going to be short-lived. It's here where we get control of Flint, a very quiet and stoic man who heads out to lend a hand to his fellow villagers amidst the raging forest fire. It's also here where we get to explore Tasmili Village for the first time and get to know some of the residents, each of whom have unique names and their own quirks to make them stand out. There's a real sense of community between the villagers as they all try to pitch in however they can, especially when two of the residents, a father and son, go missing. The father, Lighter, is found and left to recover from his wounds while Flint heads into the burning forest to find the missing boy. Flint manages to save the boy, Fuel, just in the nick of time, but not before taking care of a weird flying rodent. The first sighting of an unnatural creature and certainly not the last. A rainstorm puts out the fire and while things seem to be settling down, Flint and the villagers realize that Hinawa and the kids haven't returned from their visit with Alec. More troubling is the discoveries made by the search party soon after, such as Isaac reporting that he heard screams followed right after a Drago roar, some huge claw marks on a cliff, and a piece of cloth from Hinawa's dress hanging from a tree. But not much time is given to dwell on this as Flint, now accompanied by Boney and the town's bumbling thief Duster, encounters the pig-masked people from earlier for the first time, who sick a mechanical chimera on them. The trio defeat it and the pig masks flee the scene, but not before dropping a notebook that seems as if a child wrote in it, detailing plans about creating chimeras out of the wildlife to improve them. Not long after, Flint receives news that Lucas and Klaus have been found safe and sound, yet there's still no sign of Hanawa. It's not until Bronson meets up with the villagers when he confirms everyone's greatest fear. Flint's reaction to the news of Hinawa's death is gut-wrenching, going on a violent tirade and is only stopped when Lighter knocks him out with a wooden plank. While unconscious, he dreams about Hinawa as she left with the kids to visit her dad a couple of days ago, not knowing that this would be the last time they'd all be together as a family. Thanks to the internet, the death of Hanawa is one of the worst kept secrets in gaming, but the game itself doesn't really try to hide the fact that she's going to die. I don't think that knowing about her death diminishes its impact when it happens, basically. Though, speaking as someone who went into this completely blind when I first played it, it was one hell of a punch to the gut. 
and to think that the heartbreak is only just beginning. For you see, Flint is put in the Tasmili jail, going down in history as the jail's first occupant, and is visited by Klaus, who reveals his plan to avenge his mother by killing the Drago that killed her. He only finds out about his son's suicide mission when Lucas accidentally spills the beans. While the rest of the village mourn the loss of Hanawa, Flint can't waste any time and heads to the plateau with Alec to save Klaus. Alec suggests asking the Magipsies if they know where exactly Klaus went. This group of seven magical, flamboyant, androgynous beings that won't at all become the source of a McGuffin hunt in a later chapter. The pig masks also continue to be up to no good, though thankfully they have an instant revitalizing device from Earthbound for us to use. Eventually, Flint and Alec reach the top of the plateau and find the Drago that killed Hanawa, mechanized like the caribou from earlier as a result of the pig mask experiments, turning it violent. Flint manages to subdue the animal after a few thunder bombs to the face, but is stopped from killing it when the Drago's baby jumps in to protect its mother, reminding Flint of what he's lost and causing him to break down, with Klaus's unconscious body close by, hidden by the surrounding cliffs. And so the tale first begins as a tragedy. The first chapter of Mother 3 is one of the most effective intros I've played in any video game. In a short amount of time, the game makes you care for these characters and then proceeds to make them undergo unhealable trauma. There's still that trademark mother wittiness, but it doesn't take away from the more serious direction this story takes. It almost doesn't feel like a Nintendo game with just how depressing the start of this game is. And it's because of how different this game felt compared to most of the games I had played in the past that I got super invested. When chapter one ended, I committed myself to see Mother 3 through to the end, no matter what. The next two chapters are much lighter in comparison. They mainly serve as setup for things that will become much more important later on. As Flint continues his hunt for Klaus and Lucas stays home to try to recover from the horrific nightmare of the past few days, the game gives you control of Duster, tasked by his dad Wes to steal a special treasure from the nearby Osohei castle. On the way to the castle, he runs into a strange man with a monkey, and one of the residents, Butch, says that the man gave him a bag of money that will supposedly make his life better. Oh sh here comes the capitalism. Duster eventually comes back with what he thinks is the treasure, leading to one of the funniest moments in the game. Wes accompanies Duster back to the castle to get the actual treasure this time, running into the pig masks who are apparently looking for the same thing. Unfortunately for them, Wes is the only one who knows how to get past this big door and I'll just let this speak for itself. Soon after is when we're introduced to Kumatora, the princess of the castle with an affinity for profanity and not hesitating to speak her mind when she calls out Duster's weird smell. Duster's bad hygiene is a recurring joke throughout the game, guess he must be a Smash player. The three finally find what Wes has been looking for, a mysterious shiny egg known as the Egg of Light, but before they can make a clean escape, the pig mask army catches up to them, leading to a fight against the giant water snake and the trio getting separated when the castle's floodgates open. Kumatora and Wes reunite, but Duster and the egg are nowhere to be found. The chapter ends with a squabble in the town square after it is revealed that the bag of money from earlier has also gone missing, with Flint having to intervene to calm the once friendly village. In chapter 3, we follow the strange man and monkey from earlier, whose names are revealed to be Facade and Salsa. Facade happens to be a high-ranking commander of the Pig Masks, blackmailing Salsa to do his bidding by threatening to kill his girlfriend Samba if he doesn't cooperate. This chapter, timeline-wise, takes place before, during, and after chapter 2. As we witness what Facade was up to in Tasmili Village while Duster and Wes were busy searching the castle for the egg, gaslighting the residents into thinking they aren't truly happy with their current lives because what they need is happy boxes. He uses Salsa's dancing skills to get their attention and delivery skills to take happy boxes to some of the residents, though not without a little motivation first in the form of animal cruelty. It's also revealed that Facade is the one who stole the bag of money he gave to Butch in the last chapter, in an attempt to turn the residents against each other and create conflict where there never was any, aiding with his manipulation and positioning himself and the pig mask as the answers to the people's problems. Kumatora and Wes aren't buying it though, seeing Facade's facade, ah, I see what they did there, and they break out Salsa later that night. They don't get very far before being confronted by the pig mask in a giant tank, but then all of a sudden, Lucas saves the group with help from the friendly Drago from the prologue. The group 
group of unlikely heroes band together vowing to resist the Pig Mask's influence and doing what they can to prevent Tazmili from being corrupted by it. Unfortunately, as we see in the next chapter, three years have passed and the Pig Mask have essentially fooled every one of the residents into accepting a new life of consumerism, selfishness, and becoming the most shallow versions of themselves, perfectly content with being pawns in a system that does nothing but exploit them. The happy boxes were actually material objects like TVs and the like, because you know what they say, if you aren't happy, just buy more superficial sh**. The only ones still clinging on to the way things used to be are people like Wes, Flint, and Lucas, who we finally take control of about a third of the way through the game. Lucas has grown a lot over the years, having to mature rapidly because of the mother and brother he lost and a father who is still obsessed with finding Klaus. It's appropriate that he becomes the main character once he's learned to be independent. But getting back to the topic of Taz Millie's transformation, walking through the new streets and talking to the NPCs is honestly depressing. The first three chapters had some of the most likable side characters in the whole series because they felt like actual, well, characters. People who had actual interesting things to say. Now, so many of them are reduced to shells of their former selves. Wes's home has been made into what is essentially a retirement home for the elderly, but it's so worn down and not maintained at all. Wes and the rest of the folks here have been cast aside since, in the eyes of the pig masks, they've worn out their usefulness. Child labor is also normalized now and that's up. Those who refuse to conform to the new way of life have their houses struck with lightning, like the Gravekeeper and Lucas's family, Alec included, who was forced to move into the retirement home. Before this chapter, every side character had their own unique sprite, name, and identity. Now sprites are shamelessly reused, you have random generic tourists with names like Guy and Girl, spewing absurd nonsense, as if they've been ripped straight out of… Earthbound. The new world order that the Pig Mass have introduced has turned the world of Mother 3 into a carbon copy of the world of Earthbound. That game's wacky tone has returned, but now it's incredibly unsettling because we know what was lost as a result. Of course, most of this stuff went completely over my head during my first playthrough, but that's what has made every new playthrough of Mother 3 so interesting and engaging. There's always something new I pick up on, like an Earthbound, but in Mother 3's case, there's also more to notice and appreciate regarding its social and political commentary and other major themes, especially when you learn more about the true state of the world before the Pig Mask army even arrived. Assuming you play with the mindset that Mother 3's story takes place after Earthbound, which I think most would assume, what happened to the world of the previous game that caused life to revert back to a pre-industrialism age where concepts like commerce were completely absent before Facade's intervention? But I'm getting ahead of myself here, this will be more relevant when we reach later chapters. I just wanted to bring this up now to reinforce my appreciation for how nuanced Mother 3's story is. Anyways, let's get back to Lucas as he learns PSI from a naked matchup scene in a hot spring. Lucas learns from word of mouth that the band DCMC's new bassist looks an awful lot like Duster. Lucas and Boney make their way to Club Titty Boo, as that's where the band plays every night. Like I said, they meet one of the Majipsies from Chapter 1, Ionia, along the way, who helps Lucas unlock his psychic abilities. And this is also where he learns PK Love, a very powerful ability that only Lucas can use. After doing some part-time work in a factory reminiscent of the good old days of Never, Lucas and Boney gain permission to go to Club Titty Boo, with Boney putting on a very convincing disguise that I really want a plush of because just look at him, he's freaking adorable. The bouncers aren't really buying it though, that is until Kumatora, posing as a waitress in the club, lets them in and confirms that DCMC's bassist is in fact Duster, now going by Lucky as he lost his memory after the incident at the castle three years ago. We're just in time too for the band's encore as they play King P's theme, the same song that played in the Earthbound 64 trailer actually, and this is one of my favorite parts of the game. It's such a kick-ass rendition of the Pig Mask theme, which itself is very reminiscent of the Star Wars Imperial March, so all in all, great f***ing music here. When the concert ends, Lucas and Boney meet up with Lucky. He does remember where he hid the egg, but doesn't remember who he is. Nevertheless, after getting support from his fellow bandmates, Lucky decides that his purpose right now is to be Duster and help with getting the egg back before the Pig Mask army finds it. DCMC play a tribute and farewell to their bassist, and finally, after all this time, we have the full party together. Lucas, Kumatora, Duster, and Boney, as they set out to find the egg and hopefully stop the Pig Mask's reign of tyranny and bad television. 
television. Not everyone is a fan of the overemphasis on story in this game, and I get that. But when I look at the advantages that it brings to the table, like the better animation quality, cutscenes, and meaningful interactions between the characters, sometimes it gets a little hard to look back. Nah, I don't really mean that last part. I still love Earthbound's open-ended nature, but Mother 3 is a different beast entirely. But you know, I've spent so much time talking about the first half of the story or so that I've neglected how Mother 3 is also the most fun game of the trilogy to play. Now that every playable party member has been introduced, let's talk about Mother 3's gameplay. There's actually six party members in this game, technically, but Flint and Salsa are exclusive to certain chapters, while the other four are who you'll be in control of for most of the game. Like the previous games, Mother 3 has a turn-based combat system, and really, not much has changed since last time. You still have the same basic options as before. The rolling HP mechanic from Earthbound comes back, which is great. Still comes in clutch when you fight those nastier foes that hit super hard. Now you can see item descriptions in battle, which is super helpful in case you forget what a certain item does or how much health Nutbread restores compared to a bag of pork chips. The bag of pork chips is the better healing item, actually, so if Mother 3 has taught me anything, it's to keep splurging on junk food. In terms of difficulty, it's still nowhere near as hard as Mother 1, but I do think that it is a bit more challenging than Earthbound. There's more difficulty spikes here that, in my opinion, do require a bit of grinding to get past. The fight against the Drago at the end of Chapter 1 gave me so much shit on my first playthrough, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. I used save states when I first played the game because of how much it was kicking my ass, and I really did not want to put the game down like I did with Earthbound. Other bosses, especially some in Chapter 7, are no joke, so expect to see the game over screen at least a couple of times. The good thing is that since the main way most international players like myself will play the game is through emulation, there is a speed up feature just begging to be used. Though even without speeding things up, I guarantee it's nowhere close to the nightmare of Mother 1's runtime being comprised of 30% grinding. And thankfully, there are no longer any situations where you have to waste time leveling up a new party member because they start at level 1 or some shit like that. My biggest recommendation is saving at every opportunity. These cute little frogs serve as your save points in this game and also your ATM after chapter 3. In barrels, driving RC cars, wherever they are, let a frog save your progress. Hotels are completely absent now, same with hospitals. Now you have hot springs which completely heal your party from any injury, status ailment, and even death. These things are a godsend. Dungeons that would normally be super difficult, like the first trek through Osohei Castle, are a lot more manageable now thanks to these. And when you still have things like magic butterflies to restore some of your PP, Overall, it's not a terribly taxing RPG. It helps that your party members are, once again, very capable in battle. Flint taps into his Clint Eastwood persona and specializes in using brute strength to deal major damage at the cost of low accuracy, or buff up his defense. Salsa is pretty weak but uses his special monkey tricks to gain an edge in battle, the most useful one in my opinion being Monkey Mimic that lets Salsa copy an enemy's attack, making up for his own low attack stat. Much less situational than Pooh's mirror ability. On to the main four. Lucas and Kumatora are pretty much carbon copies of Ness and Paula from last time, right down to having the same exact PSI abilities. Some key differences include Lucas's PK Love, which now gets upgraded as the story progresses instead of having it get stronger as he levels up, and Kumatora uses her fists instead of frying pans for physical attacks. These two are the only two PSI users in the game though. Duster has high speed, uses kicks for physical attacks, and his unique gimmick is his set of thief tools used both in battle and when exploring. Though don't get too excited about the exploration part, it's pretty much limited to using the wall staples to climb up specially marked walls. In combat, the wall staples can be used to pin an enemy down, the siren beetle turns an enemy around, making them more susceptible to damage, tickling an enemy lowers their defense, putting on the scary mask lowers their offense, the smoke bomb makes enemies cry, and finally the hypno pendulum puts them to sleep, with an added benefit that I'll get to in a bit. Duster also really likes cheese and other smelly foods. His bad hygiene suddenly makes a lot more sense. Lastly, there's Boney, the item bitch. Okay, I I love Boney. He's a very good boy and his sniff ability is great for revealing enemy weaknesses, but like Salsa, he doesn't hit very hard. His main strength is his speed, which is even higher than Duster's, meaning he pretty much always goes first at the start of every turn. So the best strategy is to load Boney's inventory with your best healing and offensive items, since throwing bombs and launching rockets are going to be where the real damage comes from. While I think that Earthbound's main party is a bit stronger, especially with there being three main PSI users in that game, I prefer the greater variance in Mother 3 
party, with every member having a clear designated role. And then there's Boney who carries all the food. This is also my favorite party in the series because I simply like the characters way more. I mean, I talked about how much I like Ness and Jeff in Earthbound, but here we have Lucas, who I already talked a bit about and will talk a bit more about later, Duster, who's just a great guy to have around, his limp and odor notwithstanding, Kumatora is a really entertaining and unique character, never one to refrain from being blunt. And it's nice having a strong female protagonist who doesn't conform to traditional gender roles. This series is great with inclusivity and representation, as I said in the last video. And Boney... Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? Anyways, I mentioned earlier that there's a hidden benefit to Duster's Hypno Pendulum. You see, the biggest addition to combat this time around is the music combo system. Every battle theme has a certain rhythm that you can match with button presses to start a combo, with a max combo you can get being 16. Now, I am very illiterate when it comes to music, so I usually have a hard time timing the button presses correctly. Some songs have easier rhythms to notice than others, but if you can put an enemy to sleep, the music gets drowned out and you can clearly hear the enemy's heartbeat, which matches the exact rhythm required for a music combo. In some cases, this extra bit of damage can shave off a whole turn from a fight, and I feel that it makes the combat even more interactive. It makes the battle system as a whole more energetic and fun, with the cherry on top being how every character has their own musical instrument that plays when you execute a combo. A guitar for Lucas, an electric guitar for Kumatora, a bass guitar for Duster, barks for Boney, a saxophone for Flint, a synthesizer for Salsa, and even Klaus gets his own instrument in the prologue, a sitar. I will admit though, in some cases, mainly with Lucas's guitar, it can be distracting when trying to listen to the song's rhythm, leading me to prematurely drop a combo. However, the cool thing is that if you want to practice timing each battle's rhythm, you can refight any enemy through the battle memory book and practice until you have the combos down pat. This is the best that the combat has ever been, boosted even more by the little touches like being able to see each party member above their status boxes, spells like PK Life Up having visual effects now, and of course, those classic trippy backgrounds. While I'm on the topic of visuals, Wow. Mother 3 is one of the best looking GBA games I've ever played, managing to avoid the problem that a lot of GBA games suffer from where the colors get washed out. Mother 3 is vibrant, colorful, and every sprite is incredibly detailed. The added animations I mentioned earlier are great. Watching some of these cinematics makes me yearn for some kind of animated adaptation of this game. Hell, of the whole series. The menu looks cleaner than ever. Gone are the days of having multiple menus on the screen at once. The environments in this game look really pretty, a big step up from Earthbound if you ask me. And despite the reduced screen real estate and larger character sprites, the game doesn't really feel that boxed in. And the zoomed in camera makes sense anyway, since this is a more linear, condensed game with a smaller overworld. Though now that I think about it, there are a few times where I run into enemies because of the more limited view, which is now even easier to do with the return of running from Earthbound beginnings. Running is a little weird to pull off though. You don't just hold the button down and immediately go into a sprint. You have to be at a standstill first, then hold down the B button before letting it go to make your character take off, and every time you run into something, you revert back to the regular walking speed. It's one of the more awkward mechanics in the game. At the very least, you can get rid of lower leveled enemies this way by running into them, though unlike Earthbound, you don't get any experience from it. Still, helps for whenever you need to backtrack, which is a bit more of a pain to do now since this is the only game in the series without a form of fast travel. The closest you'll get to fast travel is certain vehicles you can ride in certain chapters, which in turn are limited to certain areas. Thankfully, like I said, this world isn't very large. And navigation isn't really an issue, since you always have a map on hand and can talk to maps in so you can mark your next destination. It's pretty hard to get lost with Mother 3's more straightforward design, though sometimes how you progress through some areas requires thinking outside of the box. And if you need more help, these sparrows can offer hints on what to do next, and in some places, these lizards will quite literally point you in the right direction. But yeah, the backtracking can get occasionally irksome. Chapter 1 alone makes you go through some Sunshine Forest upwards of three times. You go through Asohei Castle twice in Chapter 2 and a third time in Chapter 5 if you want to fight an optional boss for some equipment for Duster. And sometimes, the game won't even let you run because of this new mechanic that changes how PSI is learned. Now, instead of strictly being tied to the level system, Lucas and Kumator will occasionally get a fever while exploring, and they gain a new PSI ability when it goes away. But when either of them have a fever, you can't run at all. Not really a fan of this. I think this is an example of the mother quirkiness getting in 
in the way and hurting the experience instead of improving it with a clever twist. You know, I'm already talking about the things that I don't really care for in this game, so I may as well get some of my major complaints out of the way already. Though trust me, there's not that many, and really I wouldn't even consider them major. Without going into story spoilers that I haven't gotten to, and for those who may have just skipped to this section to avoid seeing anything about the story, there's a certain plot twist that is foreshadowed so heavily that it's pretty much impossible to not see coming. I just wish that it wasn't so on the nose. Perhaps it was intentional, maybe it wasn't supposed to be as big of a secret as I think, but whatever, it's not too big of a deal. As for my least favorite fights in the game, they're both in Chapter 7. This gorilla because it took me way too many tries the first time to realize that using PK Thunder on it makes it go berserk, making the battle way more hard than it needs to be, and the barrier trio always gives me sh**. I never feel like I'm at the correct level when I get to these guys. Almost all of their attacks take away most or all of my health, especially PK Starstorm. I guess I'm getting a taste of my own medicine after spamming this ability so much in Earthbound. And as you may expect by this point, the completionist in me has a few grievances. A lot of the ultimate equipment once again only drops rarely from certain enemies. Though to be fair, the odds aren't anywhere near as stacked against you as Earthbound's 1 in 128 bullshit. My main gripe is with the after mentioned battle memory book. Now I think this reward is only in the fan translation, but if you fill out the battle memory book you can unlock a hard mode. Thing is, it's not as simple as just fighting every enemy to log them in the book. See, most regular enemies also have a back sprite that's only visible when sneaking up behind them outside of battle or by forcing them to turn around with Duster Siren Beetle, and it's just a real flow killer if you try to get every enemy to turn around. Though it's a safe bet that bosses only have a front sprite. Oh yeah, and this section can eat a dick. The timing required to prevent this robot from blowing up is so precise, though at the same time it's kind of funny if you let him down after he gave this big speech about putting his life in your hands. I think I need to see a psychiatrist. Let's see here. Inventory space is still pretty cramped, but that's circumvented by these item guys who are a much more convenient replacement for the Escargo Express from Earthbound. There's only two save files, really wish there were more. Um, the trek with Alec in the cave in chapter 1 is basically the only time that the game's humor felt out of place, considering, you know, everything that has just happened. And other than that, I feel like I'd really be stretching to find things that genuinely bother me about Mother 3. There's a reason why I put it on such a high pedestal, there's so much I love about it, and so so little that I find wrong with it. So if you don't mind, I think I'm gonna get back to praising the hell out of this game, like its humor, which barring that one example I just brought up, is as amusing as one would come to expect from the series at this point. The general comments I made about Earthbound's writing in the last video pretty much still apply here. Mother 3 may be a more serious game, but it's still very funny and entertaining, staying true to the spoofy nature that has made the franchise so famous. I really mean it when I say that you won't regret going out of your way to talk talk to every NPC if that's what you decide to do. Every line of dialogue is pure gold. Itoi was truly at his peak when writing this game's script, and I can't praise Tomato and the Mother community enough for how excellent the fan translation is. You wouldn't even know that it's an unofficial translation without somebody telling you. It is because of these talented people that I and many others fell in love with Mother 3 so much, so I say that they deserve just as much love as the original staff. I also have to commend the greater focus on visual humor. The drastically improved animation has allowed the team to utilize it for comedic effect. To give some examples of some of my favorite moments in Mother 3, you can run into Hinawa's chair to make her surrender some nut bread to you. After rescuing fuel, you can try to wash off in the hot spring, but it only cleans the lower half of your body. The way that Boney drags Duster in this scene always gets a laugh out of me. The drunk ghosts in Osohe Castle are a real treat to talk to. This enemy bears it all and shows you his ass. A later fight with a pork trooper can be easily won by distracting him with some DCMC merchandise. There's a guy who's standing in line for a ramen shop, except it's not a ramen shop, it's the women's restroom. The way Lucas learns PK Flash is by getting struck by a bolt of lightning, Jesus Christ. And Kumatora learns PK Starstorm the same way. If I had a nickel for the number of times characters in this game learn PSI abilities after getting struck by lightning, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? You make your way down a snowy mountain inside of a refrigerator. One of the vehicles you can ride is a coffee table that sounds like a horse. The Mr. Saturns are back, and look at that, they have welcome gifts too. There's a section where you travel across the ocean floor and have to get oxygen from these mermen who...
Yeah, there's an enemy who's suicidal sh man, it's gonna be all right. The Resident Evil 4 remake is coming out soon, and it wouldn't be a mother game without some kind of joke involving drugs or alcohol. Tanatane Island is a f***ed up place where the party sees twisted hallucinations of friends and relatives, but hey, at least there's a hot spring at the end of it, one that Boney refuses to enter for some reason. Oh, it turns out that the hallucinations were a result of eating these psychedelic mushrooms. Oh dear god. The game can also get a good scare out of you, the most famous example being this Resident Evil S section in the Chimera Lab, where you have the ultimate Chimera hunting you in the halls and it's an instant game over if he catches you. And if there's any universal truth about Mother 3, it's how amazing the music is. We have a newcomer to the series here, Shogo Sakai, known for composing lots of soundtracks for games developed by HAL Laboratory, and he created what is, in my opinion, the best OST on the Game Boy Advance. There is not one song here that I don't love. And the system's sound limitations don't compromise the music at all. This OST was made with the GBA in mind and it really paid off. Like Earthbound soundtrack, I love just how varied it is. We've got funk, classical music, salsa, and the series continues this tradition of sampling from other songs, like Mr. Batty's theme opening with the Adam West Batman song. They knew how great this music was, because they included a sound player on the title screen. Who needs Spotify when you have a Game Boy Advance with a Mother 3 OST? Some of my favorite songs include Unfounded Revenge, Smashing Song of Praise, DCMC's theme, the character naming screen, pretty much every battle theme, a good chunk of the late game songs that I don't want to name here in the non-story spoiler section, Tazmili Village for how dynamic it is, becoming more somber as you progress through the story, and then there's the Mother 3 love theme, basically the main theme of the game. Reused often, but in different ways, from catchy and bouncy to emotionally moving. Mother 3 is among the best Nintendo soundtracks I've ever heard. In the same league as other heavy hitters like Splatoon, Galaxy, Mario Kart 8, Ocarina of Time, and many others. On a technical and gameplay level, Mother 3 isn't a drastic jump up from Earthbound, but the little improvements add up to make it an overall more enjoyable experience. Its mechanics aren't super deep, but where it's lacking in complexity it makes up for by having a strong emotional core, a fantastic soundtrack, gorgeous graphics for the system it's on, an interesting world to explore, and a contagious sense of humor and personality. And with all of that out of the way, I've pretty much covered all of my main thoughts and feelings for this game. And all that's left to finish talking about is the story and the ending. Oh boy, the ending. So chapter 5 isn't necessarily plot heavy. There's a lot of noteworthy moments, the side quest with the family of mice on the highway, the clay man getting struck by lightning, again with the lightning, goddamn, and taking off with the egg of light, and the thunder tower is a pretty cool location to end things off at. While searching for the egg, the party runs into the pig mask army again, though they aren't arrested because Lucas is mistaken for their commander. They eventually find the egg and Duster regains his memory after touching it, so that plot point didn't last very long. Lucas and company also learn that the Thunder Tower is the source of the lightning strikes terrorizing those who resist accepting the happy boxes in their homes, so they make an effort to take it down. How is the lightning produced? Animal abuse, how else? The jig is up though when they run into Facade, who remembers Lucas from three years ago, knowing that he isn't the pig mask commander and ordering the troops to capture the party. After making their way through a room full of foreshadowing and references, they make their way to the top of the tower where they encounter Facade again and he gives the command to self-destruct the tower. Before he can escape though, his unhealthy love for bananas bites him in the ass as he slips on a banana peel and falls to his doom. Lucas and the gang try to use his escape ship to escape themselves, but the poor rope snake is unable to hang on. Before it loses its grip though, the pig mask army commander Lucas was mistaken for shows himself for the first time to watch the heroes fall to the earth below. 
Chapter 6 is very short, serving as a bit of an interlude as we follow Lucas through a sunflower field before he sees a vision of his mother Hanawa, showing that Lucas still misses her dearly. This is one of the most famous parts of the game and for good reason. It's very emotionally charged with not one line of dialogue. It's a shame that the Captain Underpants movie of all things made it into a dumb meme. Chapter 7 is the longest and most unique chapter in the whole game, basically here to be a big callback to how the first two games were structured. The MacGuffin hunt I mentioned earlier finally comes into play, as after Lucas and Boney fall from the sky and survive thanks to Assassin's Creed logic, they learn from Alec to seek the help of the Magipsies, and how convenient one of them is tied up right outside. Ionia asks Lucas to escort them back to Aeolia's house, but upon arriving, an earthquake starts and Aeolia begins to fade away Peter Parker style. It is here where we learn about the Seven Needles, these mystical relics scattered across the Nowhere Islands that each belong to one of the Seven Magipsies. Someone must have pulled Aeolia's needle, the one seen in Chapter 2 at Asohei Castle, which is why she starts to disappear. Lucas, Boney, and Ionia go to the castle and confirm that the needle has indeed been pulled, and we get a big ol' exposition dump about how the Nowhere Islands are sitting atop a giant creature called the Dark Dragon. The seven needles keep the dragon asleep, but it was prophesied that one day someone who knows the ability PK love, so Lucas and somebody else apparently, would pull the needles and awaken the dragon. Now that the first needle has been pulled, the events have been set in motion. When the Dark Dragon wakes up, the person who pulled the needles will have their heart passed on to the dragon, which can lead to something benevolent if the person is good-hearted, but if they aren't, well, the world will end. A story about a fascist regime who controls people through fear and manipulative propaganda and have an unhealthy obsession with making life better with technology and f***ed up experiments on animals is now about preventing the f***ing apocalypse. Now it's an RPG. So now it's our mission to hurry and pull as many of the needles as we can in hopes of saving the world. One of the most memorable interactions in the game, to me, happens shortly after, when Lucas visits Hanawa's grave and talks to the gravekeeper, who points out how much the boy has grown and talks about how Flint is still in a depressive slump, living day to day in a perpetual cycle of visiting his wife and searching for Klaus in the mountains. Although Flint's role in the story isn't very big after chapter 1, he's one of my personal favorite characters in the story. Whereas every other mother game featured a father who was mostly absent, here we have one who loves his family more than anything else, and still clings on to the hope that he may be able to repair it at least a little. The sad result though is that this this has caused him to pay less attention to the only family he has left. There's something about the fearless tough guy who's really just a big softy on the inside that really resonates with me. The Gravekeeper gives Lucas the Courage Badge, which used to belong to Flint. Lucas and Boney make their way to the Chimera Lab and find Salsa and his girlfriend there, along with all of the inhumane experiments that the Pigmask Army have been conducting on the local wildlife, a plot detail that's reflected in gameplay as the enemies you face become more and more unsettling and unnatural. This is also the section involving the Ultimate Chimera I talked about earlier, but its rampage is stopped thanks to Salsa after learning about its weakness from Dr. Andonuts from Earthbound, who explains that he has been forced to work for the Pig Mask Army, explaining why they had access to his inventions like the instant revitalizing device. While this begs the question of how he got here and where Jeff and the rest of the Earthbound cast is, Lucas is only concerned with pulling the next needle which is somewhere nearby. Something curious I want to point out though is that the ultimate chimera gets reactivated again when the heroes leave and it escapes into the wild, and I thought that this meant that you'd be able to find it later and fight it as some sort of a super boss, but that's not the case. Anyways, Lucas and Boney find the Magipsy Doria and reunite with Kuma Tora, who's been staying at Doria's house since the Thunder Tower incident. Lucas pulls the second needle which causes Doria to disappear, confirming everything that they've learned. But at least he learns PK Love Beta so it's not a total loss. So by this point you should have a good understanding of the formula of this chapter. The seven needles are like the eight melody hunts from Mother 1 and Earthbound. Chapter 7 has you exploring the most areas by far compared to any other chapter, and it's also non-linear for the most part. This is where the game lets go of your hand a little, allowing you to sequence break and get a good chunk of the needles out of order. The overall vibe of this chapter, if I can call it anything, is also super Earthbound-esque. Like how you have to go through a mole cricket cave to reach the next needle, which looks very similar to the Stonehenge base dungeon. And this is also where you find the Mr. Saturns in Saturn Valley, have these makeout sessions with the mermen in the ocean, and go through that mushroom trip on Tanatane Island. You know, just a lot of random moments like an Earthbound. Though I'd imagine that those who weren't really big fans of either of the last two games may consider this to be Mother 3 
series low point. Still, you can't deny the change of scenery that this chapter brings, all the bosses you face, and the comical moments. Soon you reunite with Duster as well, who thankfully still has the Egg of Light. But unfortunately, the whole quest to save the world isn't going so well. The masked man we saw at the end of chapter 5 is revealed to be the other PK love user who started pulling the needles in the first place. He manages to pull two more of the needles before Lucas is able to. And if that's not bad enough, Facade is back. Having survived the fall from the top of the Thunder Tower thanks to some modifications, though he now requires an interpreter to translate his new horn language. The situation gets so dire that the masked man only has one more needle to pull for the dark dragon to obey his will. Lucas and the masked man battle over who gets to pull needle number 6, with Lucas prevailing thanks in big part to his father's badge reflecting the masked man's lightning attack. Earlier, a Mr. Saturn borrowed Lucas's courage badge to clean it, and it turned out to be a Franklin badge, another reference to the previous games. Lucas pulls Ionia's needle and the score is 3 to 3. Unfortunately, they don't know the location of the final needle or where the last Magipsy is. This leads into chapter 8 where a limo arrives to take Lucas and company to New Pork City, as their presence has been requested by King P himself. New Pork City is filled with attractions, games, overpriced restaurants, a far cry from the rural simplicity of Tasmili Village three years ago. It is a capitalist sweat dream, one that even the people of Tasmili, who have all moved here by now, aren't entirely sure that they're fond of and that it's truly the key to their happiness. And the big twist is the revelation of King P's identity, Pokey Minch from Earth. Earthbound. Except it's not really a big surprise if you played the Subspace Emissary or are Japanese, since in Japan, Pokey is known as Porky, just as he's referred as here. His name was changed to Pokey for the international release of Mother 2, and well, considering all the pig and pork imagery throughout the game, this isn't really a shock. The main impact of this is just how it adds to the question of what happened between Earthbound and Mother 3, especially after going to the city's theater and seeing a movie of the events of Earthbound on the big screen. Solidified this as a proper narrative continuation to that game. Well, the mystery is solved when the gang finds Leader, the unusually tall man from Tasmili Village who's been missing for the past three years, as he was imprisoned due to the slew of knowledge he's about to dump on us. The world of Earthbound was on the brink of collapse, and sometime after the events of that game, the world basically ended. The survivors ended up on the Nowhere Islands, the only place on the planet unaffected by the apocalypse thanks to the Dark Dragon's power. In fear of repeating past mistakes, Mankind decided to have their memories of the old world erased and had them placed in the Egg of Light, explaining why Duster regained his memory upon touching it. Leader is the only one who did not erase his memory in case this knowledge ever became necessary in the future. The survivors, who became the residents of Tasmili, essentially gave themselves roles to play in the new lives they had fabricated for themselves, living in blissful ignorance without even knowing that their entire lives are basically a lie. This is why Wes and Duster are the town thieves despite not really stealing anything. Kumatora, an orphan child when she boarded the white ship, was adopted by the Magipsies who gave her the role of the Princess of Osohe Castle, even though the Osohe Kingdom had been long dead before the survivors arrived. Porky, being the same selfish man-child we saw at the end of the last game, wound up in the Nowhere Islands after traveling through time and space for an unexplained amount of time in the Phase Disorder. He learned about the island's whole backstory thanks to the Magipsy Locria, the missing traitorous Magipsy whose needle has yet to be pulled. Porky enslaved people from different points in time to create his pig mask army, using his army to become the ruler of the islands, which he saw as his own personal playground where he could do anything he wanted, including reintroducing the very things that destroyed the old world long ago. And now he simply wants to speed up this world's destruction by pulling the seven needles with the help of Locria and his pawn, the masked man. To think that Tazmili was just as artificial and fake as New Pork City itself. This is a lot of information to digest and is delivered in an almost 10 minute long text dump. There's a lot of other details I omitted simply because I didn't really feel they were super important to include. Some aren't a fan of how this is all dropped on your lap at once without much foreshadowing. Others don't really mind it as much. I'm somewhere in the middle. There are some hints leading up to the big reveal. You know, all the items and even characters you meet that are from Earthbound being the most obvious. But the whole 
thing about the previous world ending and everyone in this game being the only survivors, it does kind of come out of nowhere. But I like what Some Call Me Johnny said in his Mother 3 video, where in the end, this twist isn't really that important to what makes Mother 3 so great. Mother 3 excels thanks to his characters and the emotional journeys they go on, with the connections to Earthbound being the cherry on top for fans of that game, and Leader's story being here mostly for lore purposes. Interesting lore I'll admit and fun to theorize about, but in the moment, it doesn't really change anything. Taking down Porky is important for saving the world, but he has already done irreparable damage to so many of the characters on a psychological level. It is because of Porky that Hinawa is dead, and Klaus is presumably dead. It is because of Porky that all of your friends and loved ones have become mindless drones. It is because of Porky that it's difficult to find any home-cooked foods anymore. He's an ass and this is all we need to confirm it. Lucas, Duster, Kumatora, and Boney go to kick the little s**t's ass, but not before having one more fight with Facade and putting him down for the count for good. Before heading to the big tower at the center of the city, you can fight this giant Porky statue who has 100 million HP. But don't worry, he goes down easily with a New Year's Eve bomb. To bring up Brawl one more time, a nice detail that I like is that the Porky statue in that game is destroyed with Ness's PK Flash, an ability that in the games has a chance of insta-killing an enemy, so assuming that this version of the statue also has 100 million HP, this is the only other way that it could be defeated easily. We also see the DCMC again just in time for their final concert since, you know, there's a 50-50 chance of Armageddon. Unfortunately, Porky interrupts the incredible music to instruct the party to make their way to the 100th floor. He can't even let me enjoy the soundtrack, man. The climb up to the 100th floor is a long one, with Porky taunting you through the intercom the whole way. At one point, the party finds Locria's house, the Magipsy that's been working with Porky and it's littered with bananas. If you still don't know who the seventh Magipsy is, Facade's clothing can be found on the bed. Yup, Facade is the turncoat Magipsy, which explains why he was able to use PSI in our last battle with him. It's never explained why he went rogue, but again, it doesn't really matter, though this is a reveal that I'd say is really good. You find some people and animals in tubes, which reminds me of the Stonehenge base from Earthbound, play some minigames against the robot Porky that you have to lose because, like the real Porky, he's a childish prick. And just in case you were still doubtful about Mother 3 being a story sequel to Earthbound, here's a whole room with a bunch of Earthbound memorabilia and Mother 1 music playing on the intercom. You can even find a pencil statue and erase it with a pencil eraser. That's pretty cute. You reach the 100th floor and take down some of Porky's robots before the DCMC, some of the Tazmili villagers, and Flint catch up to you to confront Porky. And there he is, and he's definitely seen better days. Porky may look pale and corpse-like from having lived for so long due to his time travel shenanigans, but as has been made evident, he's still the same snot-nosed brat at heart, treating all of this like a game of fun and saying that everyone should be grateful to him for improving their boring lives. What a piece of sh**. He says that the masked man is on his way to pull the final needle that's sticking out of the Dark Dragon's head underneath the city, and opens a trapdoor sending Lucas, Duster, Kumatora, Boney, and Flint to the underground cave of the future, with a layout that's strikingly similar to the cave of the past from Earthbound. Flint goes on ahead, but you eventually catch up to him, kneeling in distress and, in some way, a bit of relief, as he tells Lucas he has figured out the masked man's identity the mole cricket from the intro. See, he wasn't kidding when he said he got a lot stronger. Okay, no. The masked man, the commander that the pig mask mistook Lucas for, the only other person who knows PK love, and the only character whose instrument in battle is a sitar, is none other than Klaus. While I can see this twist coming a mile away now, my younger self didn't see it coming, and I was speechless. Even though the shock value is sort of gone, this moment just makes me happy that Flint, albeit not in a very happy way, at the very least finally has some sort of closure. He has found his lost son after all these years, and pleads with Lucas to pull the final needle, probably hoping that they can be together again once he does. We run into Porky, who's hell-bent on waking up the dragon and seeing the world's demise with his own eyes. Like any loser, the battle ends prematurely before Lucas and the party can defeat him because he changes the rules by entering an absolutely safe capsule, a device designed by Dr. Ando nuts that is absolutely safe, with the caveat that it can't open once it is closed. So Porky is stuck in it forever, literally, since he's basically said that he's immortal. In some twisted sense, Porky got exactly what he wanted, being stuck with the only person he sees as perfect in this world, 
himself for all eternity. And this is the end to one of the most evil, narcissistic villains in gaming history. He pretty much reached the same level of evil as Gygus, who by the way was initially planned to be included in the game, but I'm glad he wasn't. Porky is already a great antagonist. So goodbye Porky. Would be a shame if someone were to roll him off a cliff. The only thing left to do now is face the masked man and pull the last needle. And this is where Mother 3 breaks me. This final battle between the two brothers, Lucas and Klaus, and nobody else, as a lightning strike from the masked man incapacitated everyone but Lucas, this final battle is one of the most heart-pounding, emotional roller coasters I have ever experienced. There is so much weight behind this fight, if you can even call it a fight, it's more of a struggle. After all this time, Klaus has been found, and you don't want to fight him, and neither does Lucas, who for the first time since chapter 3, stops being a blank slate and starts exhibiting emotion, as he can't bring himself to hurt his brother. Gameplay wise, this is probably my favorite use of the rolling HP meter in the whole series, as you're forced to strategically choose when to heal with your limited PP and items. Don't be fooled, this goes on for a while and I actually died here on my first playthrough, which did kind of break the immersion. I'm the kind of guy who thinks that moments like these in video games should be unlosable for that very reason, but I digress. While Lucas holds back, Klaus just lays into you with the most powerful attacks you've seen. And this keeps going until you hear the voice of Hinawa, who pleads to her children to stop fighting. The background gets more distorted as Klaus rejects his mother's wishes and only attacks Lucas more viciously. Flint steps in and takes a hit for Lucas and begs Klaus to stop as well, to which Klaus responds with another attack. Jesus, this is freaking heartbreaking. It is only now when Lucas is able to land hits on Klaus, but doing so only makes Hinawa more upset. Violence is not the answer here. Somehow, Klaus has to snap out of the trance he's in. Hinawa keeps trying to reach him, and it was here where I realized that Chapter 6 wasn't a dream or hallucination or something like that. Hinawa was actually there. She actually spoke to Alec in a dream to place the bale of hay that would catch Lucas and Boney, and she is really here now in the final moments of the game. Hinawa's words eventually start reaching Klaus. The frenzied background begins to calm and Klaus starts attacking with less ferocity. Then, he unlocks a memory of Lucas and him as babies when Flint and Hinawa were deciding what to name them. He remembers his parents talking about the hopes they had for their children, how they'd grow up to be strong boys who they'd be proud of no matter what. And this finally frees Klaus from his shackles. He takes off his helmet and looks his brother in the eye. And then... Mother 3 is the first game that ever made me cry, and the only game that continues to make me cry 
even though I know what's coming. To finally explain why I always keep the favorite thing at the start of the game as love, it's because, well, that's the word I think of when I think of what Mother 3 is all about. This is a story about love. The love for your family, your home. A lot of the characters in this story are driven by it, though some are motivated by the lack of it. Ultimately, it is the love that Klaus still has for his brother, his father, and his mother that snaps him out of Porky's control. And it's that same love that makes him feel so guilty for the things he's done, deciding to end his life but it is a decision that is his own. He is no longer somebody's puppet. He is Klaus, and he is at peace at last. The characters all agree that Lucas might as well pull the last needle and hope for the best. And at first, it seems like the worst starts to happen instead. The world ends, and not even the pig masks with their advanced technology can escape it. Then you just get white text on a black background. End. Question mark. No, it's not really the end. You're allowed to walk around and discover that everyone is okay. And what's really cool is that even though the dialogue boxes don't have character names, you can still, for the most part, tell who each person is. Just goes to show how unique and memorable the characters are. And keeping with series tradition, the fourth wall is broken when you realize that you aren't controlling Lucas here. You're controlling yourself, and the last character you talk to is Lucas, who thanks you for all of your help and for saving the world. And the credits begin to roll. Lucas says we will meet again during the ending, and he's right, because we will meet again when I inevitably replay this masterpiece. Mother 3 is the best in the trilogy, a timeless work of art with a story full of smiles and tears. While it would have been cool to get at least one other great RPG for the N64 had Earthbound 64 not been cancelled, ultimately I think that Mother 3 turned out better because of its GBA release. I may not be too fond of Mother 1, but looking at these three games together like this just gives me a certain satisfaction and happiness. Shigesato Itoi really outdid himself, creating Nintendo's most special franchise. A franchise with an amazing community and legacy. It sucks that, officially at least, this trilogy is still sort of incomplete outside of Japan, and that there aren't any plans at Nintendo that we know of to do anything with Mother other than the occasional re-release of the first two installments. But I wouldn't say that Mother is dead, as its spirit lives on thanks to the fans. There's the spiritual successors like Undertale and Amori, and passion projects like this Welcome to the World of Mother 3 tribute that I seriously recommend checking out. It's absolutely beautiful and makes me crave a remake of some kind in this style. Or something like the Link's Awakening remake. Oh, wouldn't it be great if Earthbound 64 gets revisited and brought back to life like what they did with Star Fox 2? Or, <clears throat> I'm getting off track here. And I can't not mention Mother 4. I remember being so excited for this when it was slated for a winter 2014 release. Back when I was still a freshman in high school. A while back it got rebranded as Oddity and I'm still waiting. No disrespect to the team by the way, I'll wait as long as I have to. The footage I've seen looks incredible. Though there is another Mother 4 currently in development as well. I just hope it doesn't get the AM2R treatment. Itoi has said that he's completely fine with fans doing this kind of stuff even though he isn't interested in making another entry, and that just makes me love the man even more. I love the Mother series, and I had a lot of fun finally sitting down and just sharing my thoughts on these games. It may have taken 5 months for me to finish everything, but I'm glad I did it. But now, it's time to move on to other games. So Happy New Year everybody, and I will see you all again soon. Now please Nintendo, give us Mother 3. Oh